Hey everybody, thanks for sticking around. I'm Steve Pond, he's Willem Dafoe. Welcome, thanks thanks for coming and, and sure. this this must be old hat for you being at the Cannes Film Festival, right? I've been here many times, um, but you know, it's always different. It's always now, it's, uh, we're always excited to be here and then meet with Chungri because uh, I'm always here for a different reason or for a different show. I've been here in many different capacities. Um, been here when, uh, you know, with films and competition, films and sidebar. I've been on the jury, which was a wonderful experience. And now I've been here also just, you know, uh, attached to movies that were looking for fine nets and that sort of fine kind. I mean, I feel like you're here in many different capacities, just in kinds of kindness. <laughs> I mean, we didn't plan this, but we seem to have a theme today, which is we're interviewing people who have played three roles in their movies. I believe because we had Diane, Diane uh, Kruger yes. here, and she plays three roles in The Shrouds. Wow, I didn't know. They didn't know. Yeah. Very different kind of movie and not a triptych like this one. Yes. But um, So, Yorgos Lanthimos seems to have assembled almost like a troop of, of actors who go from movie to movie with him. How did... How did did he bring this up to you while you were working on four things? Or? No, um, it was after. I don't remember how much after, but not too much time. At, uh, uh, four things had a long um, post-production. So uh, he had been working on the script because he was writing it with his uh, writer that he wrote many, all the things with before The Favorite um, and uh, Poor Things, which Tony McNamara wrote. But before that, he worked with uh, Filippo, uh, Ethimos, uh, Ethimus Filippo, and they'd been working on this for years together. So they felt like it was ready to go. They were waiting for uh, uh, FX stuff and things to complete um, the post of poor things. And he thought, why not? We're, we're ready to go. And uh, he called me up, and I was very happy to hear from him because I had a wonderful time and poor things, and I enjoy working with him so much because uh, I just feel very comfortable with him. He gives, interesting, he gives me interesting things to do. Um, his films are the kind of films that I love, where particularly this one where the audience, they're rich, and the audience can kind of make the movie, their own movie, because they bring their experience to it. He doesn't tend to point to things. Uh, there's a complexity and a richness in the material that different people are gonna see different things. And I like that, because I think that that point in cinema where you say, what is this? What do I think? Wow, what's going on? Is the place that Curiosity starts, and when you're curious, you go towards something, you learn something, and I think that energizes you and kind of uh, it gives you a better life. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, was there something about the experience of of making poor things that made you think, "Yeah, I'll, I would, I'll do whatever this guy pretty much, asks." Pretty much. I mean, you know, yes. I've always been director-driven. Director is probably one of the most important, if not the most important element when you're deciding uh, what to do. Because I feel most comfortable when I can really give myself to uh, a director. I feel free then and I feel most comfortable to uh, do the best work and have the most fun. Um, so once you have a good time, uh, not only do you want to repeat that because you have a you have a shorthand, uh, there's a trust there, but also there's something beautiful about being the f in the fabric of a uh, director's work. I like working with him very much, and I hope to again. I know I'm not going to be in the next one, though. <laughs> but sometimes no. you look at the thing and, you know, uh, it's nice to work with the same director, but if they have a project that you don't fit into, you know, you don't force... Uh, uh, square peg into a round hole. But, I mean, obviously he's not looking for just one thing out of you because he has you playing three different yeah. roles in, in this one. No, he, I think he looks for a certain kind of actor that 
you know, his game works from a physical place, doesn't need a lot of explanation or discussion. He speaks, he, 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 we talk very little. And his, his direction is very specific and very uh, concrete. And, he, and we don't talk a lot. He gives you a beautiful setup, gives you things that tell you a lot and uh, set you up beautifully. And then you try to inhabit them. He watches them. And sometimes I think he doesn't even know where things are going or what they mean. Um, but he's very responsible in the respect that he, he owns everything. Um, and he's very, uh, he's, he, he takes care in a, in a uh, beautiful way. Well, so in, in this one, like for the first 55 minutes, he, he has you um, basically as this boss who controls everything in, in his employees' lives down to who they marry and what they wear and, and you know, what they do with their Ford Broncos at, at midnight. <clears throat> um, and then you're a father who sort of comes in and then, boom, is gone. And then you're a, you know, a cult leader in an orange Speedo. Um, <laughs> you have to see it. Um, but, I'm, I mean, was there a... I, I remember we talked about poor things and you were saying, you know, you studied medical books, you drew on your family's history in, in medicine to, to basically do research. It, it strikes me that in a Yorgos movie like this, it's less research than it is imagination. Well, it's all imagination, but this one, you, uh, you don't, you do research when you feel like you need to find the authority to pretend. You have to learn something to engage you, to bring you into that world. And there was a lot to work with in poor things. But also, there was a pleasure to, um, because it's a period thing, it's very different. So you don't want to be in a certain kind of head to enter this period world. So it was fun to look at all these period uh, medical things and, and deal with period medical instruments and things like that. For this, it's contemporary. It's in a way, you know, you didn't want huge differences in the character. The uh, characters they're thematically linked, and you don't want it to be a show. You don't want it to be a show of an actor's, you know, ability to do many things. What you do want to do is you want to serve the story, and my my job in each story is very different. Sometimes I drive. Sometimes I'm a linking piece. Sometimes I'm atmosphere, you know? And that, that's a very different process. So I, I didn't feel the need to do so much research. I, in the first, I don't know how many of you saw the, uh, the film, but like in the first one, it's, it's uh, well written. So the writing is really something to follow. And then kind of the business, powerful businessman controlling uh, the controlling businessman uh, world is something in my imagination. I don't live there, but I, I got an imagination about it. Um, and then another one, I play a father. It's I'm cueing off of Emma. I'm just trying to do what she needs, you know? And then uh, the cult leader is just fun because, you know, uh, it's, there's no repercussions. Uh, you know, he gets to... Um, Sleep with everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Yorgos typically doesn't do traditional rehearsing. He brings you all together to basically play theater-style games. Yes, but very few people do uh, have time. It's an economic thing normally. There's very little rehearsal usually. Before the production or even sometimes even on the day as you're setting up the shot or... It depends on the film, of course. But generally, it's unheard of that for two weeks before the cast is there to do rehearsals, just to fool around and get to know each other. And that's what he does. And that time is crucial because he really makes a, a company. Uh, you know, without being cute uh, about it, you know, he, you get familiar with each other, you embarrass each other, you fail in front of each other. 
and you get to know people's strengths and their weaknesses. And also who he is gets revealed to you because he's very good at directing these theater games. You know, these theater games, I'm from the theater. I still work in the theater, but from, I grew up on this stuff. So it's like, really, we're going to do that? But what elevated it was his, his beautiful um, way to set them up. And they, they were great. He, he, he really makes a company that way. Um, so it's very important. Are, are they tied specifically into the, the movie, the characters in any way? They're people. We could do it right now, you know. We could, uh, we could do some of the stuff. It, it, we don't deal with the text. We don't deal with psychology. We don't talk about things so much. We may deal with the text, but we'll use it as an abstract thing, as words, you know, not for not try to explore character and meaning, just to get familiar with it and kind of take, <clears throat> kind of not create associations, but just be free. You have those words become your words. You know, if you do something enough, it becomes yours, you know? And um, particularly when you don't attach meaning to it, it's like basically the training that you do as an athlete or a dancer, you know, you, you do these things and then it gets in your body, and then you use that uh, as part of a language. Right. So I know that he, f he basically filmed the three back to back. You did one story and then the next. Were there, were there breaks in between? Did you, did yeah, you need uh, to reset? Or, a weekend. <laughs> I mean, this is, a, this is a, we shot quite quickly. And uh, yeah, it's not a big budget movie. So it was pretty chop chop. Was, was that I mean, I, you know, the se sequences that I wasn't in. So one thing that I, it was kind of fun. I'd seen a lot of his movies before, but while I was working on, I normally, when I'm working on a movie, I don't feel compelled to, or, or, or even want to particularly watch movies because I don't want those things in my head. But I watched all of his stuff all over again in my downtime while I was working on this movie. And it was really fun. It kind of cemented my my thoughts about him and, and, and also I remember when I first saw these movies matching how I felt about the movies then and how I felt them about the movies now. Because in some cases there were big jumps, yeah. Okay, so w which one, which, which Yorgos movie changed the most in your, in your head between the first time you saw it and, and this time? Ah, uh, I don't know. Um, for some, I really loved I think I, I think I appreciated much, 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 much more on a second viewing killing of a sacred deer, which compared to the early ones, Dog Tooth and, and uh, some of the more, the very early kind of experimental ones and the shorts and things like that, uh, it's sort of more conventional, but I think it's a beautiful movie. I, I felt like there was a lot of the DNA of Killing of the Sacred Deer in, in this one. Yes. Yeah, they're both kind of uh, Greek tragedies. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I also feel like the original title of this one was And, right? Yeah, we're, <laughs> which is really good because we're shooting in New Orleans, which is a beautiful place and a very, a very particular place. And I'd be walking down the street sometimes and it would usually be working class guy would see me and he'd say, hey, Will, Will, what are you doing, man? And I'd say, I'm doing a movie here. And, and he'd say, yeah, yeah, okay, cool, cool. I like your movies. I have an imagination about what movies that I do he sees. <laughs> and he's like, what are you doing, man? You know, and I'm like, um, I, I'm working with uh, Yorgos Lanthimos uh, uh, on his new film, you know, Blank Look, no problem. Uh, what's the title, man? And? Yeah, yeah. Okay, but what's the title, man? <laughs> and? Yeah, my, and what? I mean, what, what, what kind of title is that, man? <laughs> so after a while, I learned to say when that would come up, I was like, uh, it doesn't have a title <laughs> yet. <laughs> I mean, I have to say, once you've seen it, and is a perfect title, but... Um, a little bit, yeah. but not so good to entice your friends to go to the theater and see it. 
Right. So you you go to switch to kinds of kindness, which is not a word that I would associate with any of the stories well, in this film. Well, let's face it. It's an ironic, beautiful... I, I like the title because uh, there's a lot of brutality in this movie. And, um, you know, to give it an ironic time, uh, title kind of allows you to imagine it or experience it as a black comedy, a black social comedy. You know? right. Now, I, was, I wasn't at the press conference you guys did yesterday, but my understanding is a what lot of people... What did you think of it? Better than most, right? It was okay. I, I said I wasn't. I wasn't oh. at it. <laughs> um, a. <laughs> <laughs> but but I heard that a lot of people were asking Emma about the nudity and the sex scenes in it. Um, I was there, and I don't recall that. Really, it's okay. you know. Guess what? Sometimes stuff gets reported in a funny way. <laughs> <laughs> no. The emphasis oh. is on the wrong syllable. <laughs> Um, what I want to ask about is the kissing scene between you and Emma, because I've never mm. seen a camera get, that, get close that close to lips before. Well, you're right, watching the wrong movies. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, fun. <laughs> you know, um, I don't know whether to tell you this. It's kind of fun, but you haven't seen, not that many people have seen the movie, but no, I won't say it. Oh. No, it's a spoiler. Go see the movie, then I'll tell you. No, it's no good. No, it's no good. You don't need to know. But um, yes, that was very fun to do, and I, I love Emma. Um, she's beyond what you think. If you like her as an actress, she's, uh, for me personally, and you know, it's kind of disgust not fun to have other actors gush about other actors, and... I always have a hard time when people, you know, say, how was it working with Santa? You, what are you going to say? They were a drag, you know, they're selfish. But really, um, so it's no fun to talk about other actors. But in this case, I can say she's really special. And the thing is that, um, I mean, it's clear from her performance she's special. Because she's free, but she's also got chops, you know. And that's the combination you want. Uh, you know, to know how to go between control and abandon and know what the right measure is. But above all, I like being with her because she brings out something in me that not everybody brings out. And that's a kind of playfulness and a kind of um, sweetness that I don't always have. Yeah. I would, I would think if you can't be playful, you have no business being in one of Yorgos's movies. You know what? You're right. You're right. I don't think he likes anything too tight or too, you know, he likes people that uh, are loose and, and curious and, uh, and, and willing to take a leap, you know, know that there's something uh, to be gained from working from a place of not knowing and not to be guarded. Yo, sit down, sit down. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Abel Ferrara. And if you, and if you haven't seen a movie of his in, in the last twenty years, you're missing out because some of his best are not the last two, but maybe in the last ten years he's made some good ones. <laughs> So, you're at Cannes not just for kinds of kindness, right? You're also here with um, what you're, you're selling a couple uh, movies. Yeah, uh, yes, yes. Well, one was taken off the table before Cannes, and that was um, Tenzing, uh, and so that's no longer here. But uh, and, and right now, Late Fame, which is a beautiful, beautiful movie, and uh, it comes from a novel from Schnitzler. It's actually a novella, and it was lost for a long time. And if, if you don't know who Schnitzler is, he's an Austrian playwright and novelist. Um, I don't know the exact dates, but, you know, early 10, 20th century, right? Mid-century? I think so. Yeah. Anyway, um, he's got this beautiful novella that I had read, and I was thinking this would make a beautiful movie. And then I get a call from the director 
Kent Jones, and he says, I want you to play in this movie. And then we, uh, they attached uh, Sandra Huller, which uh, uh, it's a beautiful part for her. Uh, it shoots in New York. The original story is in Vienna, and it's been transposed to New York, uh, which I, when I first heard it, I thought, what a bad idea. But it was one of those cases where, guess what? I was wrong because it's more beautiful than the original story because it also catch, it's now set in the late 70s in New York and it's about a guy that works in the post office that once upon a time wrote poetry and he was part of a kind of poetry scene. And that poetry scene kind of died and he went off and, you know, needed a job and started another life. And one day he comes home from doing his poetry, uh, post office job, post poetry, but anyway, post office job. And a young man comes up to him and says, are you Max uh, Saxonberger? And he says, yeah, why? He says, oh, maestro, you know, you've wrote, written, you, 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 you've written the most beautiful poem in the world. You've written a collection of poems that we all adore. We're a group of young poets and, and we're having a reading and we'd love you to participate. And he's like, whoa. And not to give the whole story away because there's lots of room in this story, he starts to hang out with them and starts to, you know, an older guy that hasn't practiced this for a long time, but it was his passion. Now he's with these young people that believe in him, believe in poetry, and they're, they've got these uh, ambitions. So it's really a confrontation, uh, uh, you know, it's a, con a confrontation with the past, what could have been, his ambitions, the, the identity of an artist. Also, he, you know, it's, it's different stations of people's lives. It's very rich. And then when it's set in that particular time in New York, I relate to it very much because that's when I came to New York as a young man in the mid-70s. So it's an explosion in my head of imagination. Plus, the screenplay is a very beautiful screenplay written by Sammy Birch, who wrote uh, May, December, uh, for example. Uh, so that's one project. But very excited about that. Uh, we hope to shoot in the fall. And I, I saw a, um, a synopsis that basically said it was How did I do on the synopsis? Okay, I'm terrible <laughs> at that usually. I, I just saw like a two-sentence thing, so you, you told me a lot I didn't know. Um, I think I made a mistake. <laughs> no. I mean, it, 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 the, I, the phrase that I remember was it's about the illusory effect that praise has on the soul. Ah, oh, oh. how could I forget that? That's what it's about. <laughs> That's the problem. I, I never think, know what things are about. <laughs> you, you cut to the chase more. But, you know, as, as someone who's, who's you, you talked about relating to it, as someone who's had your share of praise thrown your way, does, is it? And the other part. Right. Um, comes with the territory. I mean, is is public attention? Is it? Can it be scary, damaging? You know, is does it have an effect on your soul? Look, um, uh, that's a. Uh, how long do you have? <laughs> no, clearly, uh, success can be a wonderful thing. That uh, you know, first of all, what is success? There's no success like failure, and failure is no success at all. You right? But um, Bob Dylan, not. Willem to fall, okay. Um, you know, success can be, uh, can corrupt too. It can uh, be the end of the line. It can, it can uh, play with your, um, your kind of pure ambitions. You can start to focus on the wrong things. Um, but success can also give you energy and contentment and make you feel strong and uh, give you the uh, energy as well. Uh, I don't know. Um, that's why I do these movies, to figure this stuff out. And guess what? You don't need to have an answer, right? It's all about being engaged with the question. And if it's done in a sincere and engaged, you know, uh, sincere way, then I think something happens to you. And that's what a performance is. And the audience, if you're transparent enough and, and if you're doing it for the right reasons they'll feel it too and they'll take on your experience 
And that's the way to share, not by saying, this is what I think, what do you think? It's, I'm going through this thing, I don't necessarily know what it means, come with me, it's gonna mean different things to different people. Um, one last thing, I, I ran across a mention of a Q&A you did with Roger Ebert at Cannes about your career of making more than 40 movies, and that was in 2000. Yeah. Um, that's like 24 years and a great many movies ago. Yes. And I wonder, at this stage, I mean, you've been doing this for as long as you have at the level you've been doing it at, is what you're looking for out of you know, acting out of movies, has that changed a lot over the years? I'm sure it's changed, but it's not, I'm not sated, you know, I mean, uh, it's still mysterious to me. I, I still, it, the only thing I can ever brag about, and it's not, doesn't come from me, and in a way it's kind of scary, but I have this defect that works to an advantage of every time I start doing something, I really don't quite know how to do it again until I do it again. Um, so when I start a project, it always feels like the first time. When you talk about can, every time feels like the first time. You try to cultivate that, but somehow, naturally, I have that. So I have no overview. I, I just know that I, I'm more relaxed. Um, I'm, I'm yeah, it connects with my life more. I know why I perform a little bit be better than I maybe used to. That shifts. I think it's natural with getting older that when you're young, you're trying to make your way in the world. You're trying to stake your claim. You're trying, you've got an identity. You've got to say, this is who I am, so you can go forward. When you get some years behind you, you say, well, <laughs> you know, uh, you don't have that same kind of, uh, the ambition becomes more personal, more practical. Um, it's not abstract. You're not trying to please other people. You're trying to function and find some kind of peace and some kind of where you serve the world and yourself the best possible. That may sound pretentious to say, but in the end, you know, that's what drives you. It's not that I do this and people say, cool, you know? It's if you feel like something is happening to you and you're sharing it and you meet other people on that, I think some, somewhere in, in my most sentimental mood, I always feel like we're put on this earth to you know, walk each other home. That's what I always think, you know? And if you really believe in that and you really practice that, and I don't all the time, nobody does, it's really hard, I think that's, that's a good life. So, um, that's my response to making movies. I mean, so I look for those opportunities. Hopefully, movies change, I change, the world change. Who knows? That probably, you know, I took credit for it seeming new every time. It's new because of what I just said, not because of me. <laughs> On that note, Willem Dafoe. <laughs>